Hi, it's Raghu Marcus. It's an it today, that's for sure. And I am happy, happy to have Krista Tippett aboard Mind Rolling. Krista, welcome to the show. I'm so glad to be with you, so yeah. to speak. Yeah, with yeah. you. Yeah. We were uh, just together, Krista and I, uh, well, months and change ago in Maui at the uh, Ramdas Krishandas uh, Jack Cornfield retreat. And um, boy, isn't it interesting? You look back and you go, yeah, we're just we're just seeping into this beautiful community and hearts with each other. And yeah. Ramdas, he made it there, even though, you know, he, he was obviously extraordinarily fragile. And we, we all had an idea, but we had no idea. Yeah. I would say he was fragile, but he was radiant. Yeah. Yeah. Really. Yeah. Really, really. Uh, I mean, you know, I was privy to seeing him, uh, just going up to his room to talk to him about something maybe he didn't have a shirt on or something. And, you know, it was corpse-like. Mm. And mm. I, um, I, we haven't really talked at all mm-hmm. since then. And I, so I knew that w- where he was summoning this will, which is uh, something else we can chat about later, mm. um, was beyond anything that I had ever experienced. It really was. And... Um, when I left Maui, which was just maybe three or four days after the retreat, I, he, let me tell you, he just, I said, so I got to go now. You know, I'm not thinking about anything except I got to go. So I want to say goodbye. And he turned to me and it was a goodbye that was an mm. obvious goodbye, mm. a l- much longer mm. goodbye. Mm. Uh, or shorter. I don't know how it all works, right? This mystery. Yeah. But uh, but I just walked out of there. I didn't for one second think of anything. You know, it's just, I, I, I'm just, I guess, pointing to the obliviousness that we sometimes can get into, you know, around loss. Yeah. Oh, well, you know, that was, I, one thing I've, I've, as I've spoken to people about the experience is, um, I think because he, um had been dying so openly and actively and um thoughtfully and publicly or you know and you want you know I'm, and you know the thing is we're all dying right but so <laughs> so i've said um i think because of the book he and mirabai wrote um there were a number of people at the retreat who are also dying which of course we're all dying, but people like him and like them who, for whom it's more proximate. And I think none of us really, we, it's really hard for us to believe that we'll die, but these are people who believe that they're going to die. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, so it was, it, it certainly you, you realized with him that he would welcome it as an adventure and a friend. And yet the, his life force was so magnificent and huge that I think it was maybe easy maybe it was harder for all the rest of us to imagine it than it was mm. for him I don't know you know you knew him you know I uh the the last Sunday which has and I, I forgive me everybody out there I've repeated this story but it's okay because it's repeatable <laughs> um So the mala ceremony, where he gives out a mala. And so before the ceremony, in the morning, we had gotten with him and said, you know, you don't have the energy to hand out, you know, a mala to over 400 people, each one, the way that you embrace each one of them. There's not possible. And he agreed he would do it, you know, to the whole audience from the stage. So we get to to the thing, and he's about to, you know, be wheeled up there. He says to me, so I'll be giving a mala to everybody, right? I go, what do you mean, right? You just agreed that you're not going to do that, that there's no way you'd have that kind of energy, and, and you're going to do it from the stage, and you know, blah, blah. He looked at me with those, <laughs> yeah. like yeah. a kid, what do you mean you're not going to let me have my ice cream? Really? Yeah. So to the last breath, he just uh, gave it all up. 
yeah, very, yeah, of course, it's so highly unusual being, uh, I mean, the, the mixture of the influx that we got from people after his passing, uh, mm -hmm. th that, uh, that blend of, oh my God, I'm feeling such presence and oh my God, I'm so sad, mm -hmm. is it was uh, poignant, really mm -hmm. poignant. Mm -hmm. Um. Okay, wait, we got to get to know you a little bit more. And and, okay. how I, <laughs> and when I first do a podcast with somebody, I always ask, what are the things when you were a kid, going into a teenager, going into you know college years and all that, Where what was the tipping point for you in terms of realizing that there is, a, as Don Juan would say, a separate reality that hmm. actually is the encompassing reality but uh, for me, it was like I was such a, I was so unhappy. And, and as soon as I, I saw the light, and, and, and for me, it was through, actually, it was through music, hmm. uh, John Coltrane, actually hmm. seeing him live when I was like 15 or 16 or something and going out of my body. Uh, and, and of course, psychedelics and so on. And throw a little Dylan in there to make sure you know, okay, wait a minute, there's other people thinking like me. Um, and uh, I knew I could be happy. There was a chance to be happy. And, and uh, we'll talk about happiness a little bit later. But what was it for you and when? Well, I actually, my childhood was very religiously immersive. It was, you know, I was in church a lot. Um, and really didn't know much beyond that world. Um, you know, church was also culture. It was where your friends were. It was kind of family. Um, and I was in a lot of Bible study and I, you know, it, I mean, this may, I don't know if you've had many people on this podcast answer the question this way, but for me, um, you know, that was the medium through for me to think about transcendence and, and yeah, I think music um, not Bob Dylan, but, 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 you know, just even just the, the music, M music was where I kind of felt like, you know, where like, I've kind of felt like my body became a soul. Um, mm -hmm. and I, although I didn't necessarily take the Bible and read it the way it was being preached to me, but I found a lot of strangeness and a lot of space between the lines um, for the part of me that was really questioning and, and kind of reaching for what you're describing. Um, mm. Yeah. And I mean, then that's really what I was given. That's what I had to work with uh, at that time and place in my life. Well, you did. Um, I, I come out of the Jewish tradition and it was just rebel from day one. Mm. Could not, Except for the music, except for the cantor yes. and, and the incantations, which I, I did gravitate towards. But it, the rest of it was so anathema to me that I couldn't. And it was, you know, much later that I realized, uh, you know, the oneness of all of these things. Actually, when we went and met Neem Karoli Baba, who just kept going, there's only one thing going on. Okay. Right. So, right. Back. Uh, so, and, and so... But then you you did uh, you know uh, or everybody I haven't even said and I I assume everybody knows about on being There's, no they don't know everybody no? does not <laughs> no but, but well it, I've known of it forever myself mm, and I think mm. anyhow but uh, it's a wonderful show that uh, Krista does and I was going to say you've investigated so many different um, paths and uh, traditions. Uh, so that I know that you have steeped yourself in, in many of these things. So how is this all shaken out in terms of your beginnings in Christianity? Well, you know, it's inter It's an interesting thing to think about because I, I think my answer is different now in my late 50s than it would have been in my 40s. Um, yeah, I mean, I've been really, I feel like this, ad this adventure of mine has been... Um, you know, not just about investigating the traditions, but about lives that are steeped deeply in them. Um, and then I've also, you know, moved beyond that to the great questions that I think animate the traditions. 
Um, and it might be physicists who are working with those questions or neuroscientists. Um, I, so, and I've been so, I've, I've had, I have so many teachers and I've been so enriched by other traditions. I would say, especially in my case, um, Judaism and Buddhism. Mm. Um, and I, and I do want to talk also about how, how Ram Das and their retreat really added this whole other layer for me. Um, but what I've also come to understand at this point in my life is that, is that Christianity is my mother tongue and my spiritual homeland. And I've kind of embraced that. So for a long time, I mean, I have a, I have a meditation practice, um, but, and it's some, and it's really important and it's been transformative. And at some point though, I realized I also wanted to be praying. And that that is, again, that is my language. And, uh, and so that's been something I think about growing older and an integration of all of this. Mm. It's, in, of course, that's interesting that that core um, of Christianity is with you and it stayed with you for such, you know, over this, uh, over your, the adventure of your life, as you just said. Um, do you know? I'm not sure what you know about us going to India and meeting Neem Karoli Baba with Ramdas when he went back the second time. But uh, so there was a, a number of us that come from the Jewish faith, mm -hmm. which was yeah, yeah, I'm interesting. most of you, I think, a, a lot, not most, but a lot. <laughs> yeah, Jack and Joseph and Sharon, you know, yeah, there's such an there, incredible Jewish Buddhist lineage. Yeah, and, yeah, I know it's kind of funny. Yeah, but um, but so within days. He said, uh, he just kept talking about Christ. Now, we, I actually grew up, and when I went to school, which was a, an Orthodox school, half mm -hmm. in English, half in Hebrew, if you can imagine learning geography in Hebrew, it, it ruined me for life. Okay? Right. Uh, so, uh, so there we were. And he's saying, where's your cross? I go, cross? And I'm thinking, like, I'm Jewish. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, stuff like that. Yeah. And then there's a famous thing that Krishnadas, who I know you know mm -hmm. of at least, uh, who he keeps repeating my story, and I complain about it all the time. But basically, I, I asked him how, how to meditate. I was really looking for, you know, you're with a Hindu guru, let him give you, a, you know, a mantra. That's what happens, right? I was so naive and so young. And he said, meditate like Christ. When he was nailed to the cross, he felt love, not pain. He was lost in love with everyone. Okay. Yeah. So that was it. Expected. <laughs> no, no, I couldn't handle that at all. all I had right. to ask Ram Dass, could you uh, kind of clarify what, how did he meditate? And you have a more convivial relationship with him. <laughs> and he did. And he just went into that space and tears came from his eyes. It was mm. Just us sitting around him, Krishna Das and, Ramesh and I and Ramdas and a couple of others, like, wow, what is happening? But really, it was just, some, he, he kept saying, you don't understand. Over and over, he kept saying that. You don't understand. He was lost in love with every sentient being. Mm -hmm. He never died. He never died. And mm -hmm. it went on from there. Um, so, yeah, I, do you know that about the link? Uh, what he gave us was beyond any kind of Hindu anything even though we did bring back some wonderful hindu practices well i i i love hearing that that very precise story you just told but i i definitely i i picked all this up um especially at the retreat mm -hmm. through the stories of all of you remembering mm -hmm. um and also you know among the there was there was um Hanuman, and there was also a picture of Jesus, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think um, one thing I've realized that really came home to me at the retreat also um, is that I what I what I what I haven't wanted to get rid of or lose is the language of God, even though what I mean when I use that word is kind of a universe away from what I meant when I used it as a child. Mm -hmm. But what that word is pointing at doesn't, doesn't go away. I don't, I, don't, I don't lose the need for that pointer. 
and I found that, and that was, it seems to me that that was also true for Ram Das. And as you're saying, it was true in that world of all of you. Um, as part of what you found in India. And that, that was kind of revelatory for me and actually kind of healing, kind of huh. hel- helping me kind of unite all of these different impulses and not feel them to be in tension with each other. Ah, uh, yeah. Yeah, that's, uh, yeah, that's a big thing. And of course, Ramdas, what better represent, you know, representative of, of this lineage could there be? Because he was so curious and so adventurous and he, he dipped into every one of these things and, and made people feel it's okay. You, you know, it's good to land on something that you really devote yourself to, but you that doesn't mean it's at the expense of all these wonderful traditions that you can bring into that one other the tradition that you're steeped in yeah. and uh yeah i think that that's a extraordinarily great thing um because it it, it also uh it, it points to generosity too mm-hmm. you know the generosity of all these traditions and you get imbued with that and you stop becoming fundamentalist in whatever it is you are doing. So, yeah, I think from that point of view, it's pretty great. Um, what else? Yeah, you were saying some other, th- uh, just reflections uh, on the retreat. Was there more than this one you just mentioned? Yeah, well, I think that that, I mean, it is a, you know, it is one of these kind of incomprehensible and mysterious observations that I think Buddhism has made most intensely, but it's there in the other traditions. This, this. Well, first of all, it's, this is one of the few places in the human enterprise where we acknowledge that we will die. Right? Even medicine doesn't acknowledge that we'll die. Right? Um, and that's huge, right? And the, and the, but but of course, the spiritual inside is that living and dying are intimately connected, and and this whole notion that's so counterintuitive to meditate on one's death as a way to live more fully. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, it seemed to me that Ram Das just embodied that, just lived and breathed that in a way that I, I, I don't think I'd, I'd seen. Um, and how joyful it was and how un-American it was, you know, <laughs> right? And how, and, how, um, and how it made everybody, it made everyone bigger. And I mm-hmm. thought, you know, I think so much um, in general about the need for the longing for uh, spirit for elders and for spiritual eldering in in young people now, mm. and how they deserve that, um, because the work ahead is long. The work of kind of reforming the world, um, and that was also such a beautiful thing. That is a beautiful thing about the community that you're part of that was that was around Ram Das that still lives on right uh, mm-hmm. it's you had this you 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 know he was kind of the consummate elder but but what was what was really striking to me and i thought so life-giving um, is 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 how he was honored in that room and the fact and, and 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 he wasn't an elder at the peak of his powers right I mean, yes, he was wise. He radiated wisdom. I think maybe he said two complete sentences in those in those four or five days, right? Mm. But somehow, um, every word he spoke was so was huge, and and he 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 just radiated what he was about. And then, of course, I mean, it, you know, it is him, and it's this it's this experience that many of you were part of. It's these stories that you all have to tell. Um. But he was a frail elder, right? He was dying. And there was something, yeah, again, so kind of unusual in Western culture, in American culture, about that being in the center of the gathering and and the care that that was unleashed when everybody just accepted that. And in a way, accepting it about him, also accepting it about themselves. Mm. Yeah. You know, I think there was um, there were times in the discussion, and it, so it, as it all came, maybe you knew m- this more openly, but you know, in the co- conversations, it would come up very organically that somebody would raise their hand and say, "You know, I I have cancer. 
I don't think I have much longer to live. I'm dying. And talking about the difference between death as a great adventure and the messy, very, un, you know, experience of dying that one doesn't, wouldn't wish on themselves or anybody else necessarily. I remember one day there was somebody sitting in front of me, a woman who had spoken up and said she was dying and she was clearly sitting with someone who I think was her son. And, but, you know, I think for, for people in this culture to be able to own that and have it just held, um, it, it may, it makes us whole or it is a part of us being more whole. Hmm. And, you know, that is, but I, I don't think I've had other experiences where that was so, uh, you know, not just accepted, but yeah, I want to keep saying honored. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The way in which, uh, and you're saying it, the, the care and the love and the acceptance of everything, because Ramdas was accepting it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Ramdas yeah. was a one-way street going out. He would... There was he didn't want anything, and you know, as in the movie Becoming Nobody, which uh, we showed at the, at the retreat, which is out there right now. Um, there's one part in it where Ramdas says, "When is what I want enough? When is what I need enough?" It's much more interesting to serve mm. others, you know. Right. So that that being the central concept, it's it's what we were given by Neem Karoli Baba in India, you know. Just little, all these little things like Ram Dass uses it. I'd say, well, okay, how do I get enlightened now? And he'd say, serve people. Yeah. And Ram Dass would go, well, that's you know. <laughs> Right. And all my Buddhist friends, they're like meditating 40 hours a day, you know, whatever. And uh, he, so he'd ask it again and he'd get the same reply, you know. And after a while, we all got what service mm -hmm. is. Not that we could embody it in that, it's certainly at that young age. And then, you know, this is a learning process all the way through life. But uh, it was, uh, one of the greatest uh, takeaways that w we came back with um, and Ram Dass embodied. And, you know, I, I just want to say, I think it's so important. Part of what was going on at the retreat, I, I hope it will still go on. I'm so glad that I'm hearing that you're going to keep doing the retreats, right? Because the story doesn't end um, with Ram Dass's death. The community doesn't end. The love doesn't end. And, um, and I think something so important that was happening in December that I think must, you know, I hope continues to happen is that all of you who are there kind of telling the story mm -hmm. and, and it's, a, and, and, and that li the lineage becoming more and more visible um, and also becoming something that is known and claimed and carried forward mm -hmm by new people, by this yeah. larger community that goes on in time. I really did feel that very powerfully. Mm. And very true. I mean, we, uh, the board put out a New Year's message or a message after Ramdas left. And we mentioned that the overwhelming tsunami of affection for him and caring and feeling like, and feeling his presence at the same time uh, everybody was like, of course, we're going to get together, right? And we said, uh -huh. yes, this is something we talked with Ramdas about over all this past year. And it is absolutely the core of everything that uh, mm -hmm. we represent. And any real tradition does, not, real isn't the right word, but you know what I mean, uh, is that coming together and, uh, you know, and going through uh, some of the, taking a look at some of the different things you've done and on being, um, you know, that's very much part of everything that we represent as well. And it's yeah. that coming together. It's that heart. It's the bringing in of, I mean, Ramdas is not going anywhere. And, right. uh, you know, it's the bringing of all that in that we share that. And then, then it gets passed on, you know, in a very, very, um, poignant and beautiful way that's 
that's full, that's whole, as we talked about, you know, becoming whole. Uh, by the way, Krista, that there was more than one person at the retreat. This is a, okay, this is what it is. I'm going to tell you what somebody told me. There was more than one person at the retreat that was, uh, put their hand up and, you know, in terms of some of the Q&A that was going on around death mm -hmm. and dying. This person, one particular person, wrote to us and said, I went back home and I had a, a doctor's visit to, you know, to check on the tumors and so on and so forth. Anyhow, the details uh, are kind of irrelevant, although they were very, very like, wow, kind of a thing. Anyhow, she, doctor said, I don't understand, but. Uh, really? Yeah. One of those yeah. things. Yeah. So she's now walking around going, Ramdas healed me. <laughs> oh boy. So the mystery, right? We have no idea. Yeah. No idea. Um, so on being, by the way, everybody out there, it started as speaking of faith. It did. Indeed. As a public radio show. It's still a public radio show, but it's also a pod podcasting hadn't been invented. No, not then. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it's the intersection of a spiritual inquiry, science, a social hearing, healing, and much, much more. And uh, everybody, check out on being. I mean, it is just uh, what the work that you've done with this over the years, Krista, is spectacular. Oh, the thank different you. people that you've introduced, the different ideas, the different people from so many different walks of life. Uh, it's it's just uh, it's a treasure, as far as I'm concerned. And, um, so, uh, I, I just went up there a little bit and, you know, picked up a couple of things that, that were, uh, meaningful to me. And one of them was, uh, and I'm sorry, I don't even, I did not mark down who might've said this, but you might remember relationships move at the speed of trust. Yeah. Social change moves at the speed of relationships. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't, do you know who said that? Yes, that is a young woman named Jennifer, Reverend Jennifer Bailey. She's a, she's a oh. minister in the African Methodist Episcopal Church. And she is a force of nature working with new generations across religious traditions, but also very consonant with what we're talking about, which is what I think Ram Dass's uh, legacy and the and the and the you know at the core of the message of the community that that lives on, which is you know not being afraid to go into the depths of the traditions, um, and you know letting letting them continue to teach us, and also I think calling ourselves to live more closely to those depths. Yeah. So that's Jen Bailey. Yeah. Wow. I mean, uh, I talk a lot about trust, and and in reference to Ramdas when I when I first met him, and he just gave me that hundred billion percent uh, attention, mm. right? And out of that, and out of the honesty, of course, that I heard from him when they I was at a radio station. I was a program director at a radio station, and. Uh, they said, okay, Ram Dass is giving you a lecture. Can you help us? And I didn't know who that was, but Tim Leary and Richard Alpert I knew about. Uh, and then I got him to send a tape over and every word was, oh my God, it's mm. okay. Mm. I can be an idiot. It's not going, I don't need to kill myself. He's telling the truth. And so that happened. Then I went to meet him and, you know, had that presence that he shares with people right to this day. I mean, right. the day that he left. And uh, the one of the major things for me was trust. And and I say to people, when you have, and it's not, it could be trust in a person that you've met, like it was for me in that moment, but it could be just a trust in a in a mantra, trust in a tradition, trust in a uh, a piece of music. I mean, it can be anything that you can become so relaxed and so uh, safe. You can feel safe in it. Mm -hmm. that you're able to then move along the path and then faith, which is much more of a religious term, 
does happen. And to me, faith is uh, beyond rational mind, whereas trust, you've got a real thing that you can relate with and trust with. How do you, uh, does that um, jive with your Yes, and I, and I also, um, there's something else in that that, that for me connects um, very much with something that I've, I've been thinking about since we were together um, at the retreat. You know, the, the speed of, of trust and relationship is slower. It's, it's slower than we, you know, especially if we're talking about, um, you know, transforming our world, healing our world, um, creating a world that we want our children to inhabit. Um, and yet, I feel like the community that all of you set in motion you know, starting 50, 60 years ago, which feel, feel is a long time and not a long time at all. Mm. If you think, I mean, it was so extraordinary. I was so aware of it with all of you telling your stories. It was just a few people, right? A few, as you say, mostly Jewish kids. Some, some you know, 18, 19, 20, 21, right? Mm. Um, going over there to India having your minds and hearts and souls opened up to this whole new way of seeing, practicing, and literally bringing that back home. And it was so unknown over here. And yet here we are, uh, these few decades later, and I, I have really, and I know, you know, I, I'm really careful not to confuse not to collapse Buddhism and Hinduism or, or, you know, I think what people know in this culture now is mindfulness and meditation. And it's often a very stripped down version of the whole tradition. And I really felt like at the retreat and in the community you're part of, it's really a deep dive into, um, well, actually the root of Buddhism, right? The, the roots the uh, culture and i mean it's, it's hinduism as much as it's buddhism and i mean all those distinctions aren't important but they are that we don't simplify things mm -hmm. but so so i'm so but you you know you brought this whole world back and if you think about how it has i, I really have seen i feel like part of what i've seen in these years of doing speaking of faith and on being which has essentially been since the turn of the century, you know, the 21st century, our young century, our young tumultuous century. Mm. Um, this, this has just exploded into consciousness, this, this possibility of, of, um, of this spiritual technology of meditation and mindfulness and, and, and compassionate attention. Um, and I feel like this tradition the offerings of these traditions have met 21st century people kind of is precisely what is needed. And I mean, again, the work ahead is long, but there's been something quite extraordinary to observe. And yeah, you know, 60 years is a, is a long span in an individual life, but it's just a blink in the yeah. cosmic eye. Yeah. And yeah. It's it's quite amazing to think about what this small band of seekers have brought about mm. in our lifetime. I I just left kind of in amazement about that, and that's when I say I want you all to keep telling your story uh -huh. and strengthening the lineage, and then and then and then you know passing it on mm. um, because it's an amazing part of the history of our species. I think. Mm. I think a hundred years from now, one of the things people will look back at is this and the ripple effects it has. Yeah. Well, the answer to the question, by the way, I must say it, is that we, everybody out there, we are continuing to offer everything that we've been offering from the retreats. We're going to expand the ones that are more um, centric around Ramdas's specific teachings, whereas the ones in Maui is our Buddhist bhakti kind of mix which is what you were talking about which i, uh -huh. I actually um i think it's just uh, the fact that we've been so close to sharon salzberg and joseph goldstein and jack cornfield yeah. for all these years ram das and us and that all this work is going on in 
It's, it's just uh, between these two traditions and how they come together is, yeah. uh, is awesome and inspiring. So that's all going to continue to happen. And yeah, we're going to grow the whole thing in terms all around what uh, I believe Thich Nhat Hanh said, which was the next Buddha is the Sangha. Right? Mm. The next guru is the Satsang. Mm. Hmm. And and hmm. certainly around that, and that's why, um, yeah, I I love talking about trust as as we just were, and in relation to community, in you know the the uh, you I, I well, let me read something because I found it uh, on one of the podcasts. It's a uh, John Paul Lederach. Yes, he said I'm deeply convinced that change must be relationship centered. We don't create change purely on the basis of the content of a policy. We don't create change purely on the basis of winning an argument or even winning a particular vote at a given time. Change has something to do with who we're going to choose to be together as the human family. Yeah. Fantastic. Fantastic. Right? He's so wise. And he is one of these he, he is a he's a peace peace builder he was at the croc institute at notre dame um he's a conflict resolution specialist he's been you know he worked for 30 years and helped bring about peace in northern ireland he worked he he's worked for three decades in colombia and helped bring about that very young peace there so this is somebody who you know he's not it's not a theory He's put it into practice. And he's also the kind of person who in our world, you know, he's never the one standing on the stage getting the accolades when the peace agreement is signed. But, yeah. you know, the people who are doing the work and transforming lives and cultures. So, yeah, he's one of my teachers in terms of um, how all of this, yeah, how all of the, how, how these, um, in terms of, you know, it's like, and so it's so interesting for you to quote John Paul because, um, he, his observations, you know, could be, could have been said by Ram Das or could be said by you. And they have emerged through this lived practice mm, of creating huge, yeah, profound cultural huge, change. Yeah. yeah. Okay. You got to introduce me to him. Okay. I got to, I, I, I would I love to take to some that. teachings from him. I would, and he, just let me know. He, he, um, he lives in Colorado, but he gets back to California quite a lot. Oh, okay, great. So maybe Perfect. I'll just introduce you by email. Yeah, that would be yeah. fabulous. Yeah. Um, I think we, I would like to you know, talk just a little bit about um, w just what's going on in the country. Mm. And I, I do talk about it with different people um, and the extraordinary polarization that is going on and how we don't kind of recognize it within ourselves. It's hard to get really honest about it. And, uh, and I, I, I noticed that you, you've talked to a, a lot of different mm. people. You know, uh, one of them is uh, Courtney Martin. I saw something I like the hard work of disagreeing with those who are similar to us. Just start there. <laughs> Right. Okay. I looked yeah. at that. I went, yeah, yeah. right. Never mind <laughs> right. the other side where you're already yeah. lost. Is you know how about? Yeah. Uh, so, what uh, he said in our conversations about echo chambers and the necessity of speaking across difference, mm -hmm. we often forget the importance and difficulty of disagreeing with the people most like us on what's lost when we don't make that effort. Yeah. It's where we have to start, right? It's where we have to start. And I, another, another thing I think about a lot, um, and it kind of flows out of that, you know, we, we talk a lot about love, right? We spoke about a lot about love in December. You, you talk about it and think about it all the time. So do I. Um, I think we all in our lives, in our, in our, in our, our personal lives, in our everyday lives, we, we possess so much intelligence about how love really works that it, it, it would behoove us to kind of really reflect on that and, and see how that teaches us how we might be 
in larger social life. And the truth is about love that it is the most life-giving, that it, it, it calls us to our best selves repeatedly. Um, and it can be, you know, it is repeatedly pleasurable and, and something that gives us joy. And it's also really hard, right? It's messy and we fail at it. And that the people we love the most, um, the people we're most, we, 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 we know most intimately and love most intimately, um, that very often has nothing to do with agreeing with each other um, or feeling understood or understanding. And in fact, it often doesn't have to do, it's often not a feeling, right? Like there are things that we do for the people closest to us that we do, that we love them because we do these mundane acts we act loving even when we may feel precisely the opposite at any given moment. And, um, and so I think that, I, I actually think that understanding that, taking that in, uh, makes the idea that, that, that the great journey we could be on to learn to figure out what love could look like as a public good, a loving society, is nothing romantic. Right. That that in fact, it's this love is the hardest thing we do, and yet it 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 shows us who we want to be again and again. Hmm. Yeah, and and I think that if we can if we can understand how unsentimental it is, um, but how it teaches us, then I think we could start to understand what it would mean to apply that um, in wider circles to the people we in fact share life with. Yeah. Whether we like them or not. Yeah. How do we take the me out of love? Is a, is something I've been investigating mm-hmm. with a friend of mine actually, and just uh, Krishnas has a great uh, little aphorism. You wake up in the morning to the movie of me. You're mm-hmm. the director, the producer. You're the hero, <laughs> the star, the villain. You're <laughs> yeah. everything. And it goes on 24-7. And uh, so, of course, Ramdas spent a lifetime uh, dissecting that little guy and, uh, you know, around identity and roles and the story we tell ourselves and believing in our thoughts and all of that. Mm-hmm. So the, the work, is, so when we talk about, gee, if, if this could be a paradigm that, evolves from one-on-one to we're talking about us, the big us. Right. We still have to go back to the little me and get that transformed. Or, right. And this is what Ramdas has been about in terms of social act, service and social action all his life. Uh, the stuff like, you know, the SVN group, I, I believe, uh, uh, Social Venture Network, which has morphed into something else. But he helped start that. And he, he was all about you can do all of take all of these actions, but if you're if you're having any kind of anger or um, the the kind of disagreement where that's you're intractable and all of that, of course nothing will get accomplished. And he was about you know work on your heart, clean your heart up uh, at the same time as you are taking these actions, and they're not. It's not like, okay, I'm going to wait about 3 billion lifetimes before I'm cleaned up and then I'll be able to. Right, right. It's it's happening all at the same time. There's only one thing happening. So uh, it's just, yeah, love without expectations is a difficult thing. And and it takes really looking, you know, uh, at, uh, as you, the the inquiry, uh, most especially uh, Buddhism, Buddhism, the self-inquiry aspect that they have been doing for ever, uh, I think, is so valuable. And in methodology around, of course, mindfulness and so on. Um, we we have to go there when we talk about opening our hearts to a, to another person, to another group, to society in general. I think we got to go there. Yeah, and I I think that's precisely the frontier we're on. I think that in the West, in particular, we, you know, we we thought we could kind of, there's this messy, messy thing called inner life or the human drama that we could somehow shut down and bracket out 
and and we learned that while we made well we've made so much progress and you know we we thought we'd made more in terms of in terms of you know the society we wanted to build in terms of a racially just racially healed society for example um that in fact you know what we keep coming back to is the inner work and that we can change laws but if we don't change ourselves we haven't it we haven't we haven't sustainably transformed anything yeah and that's what i think and i think you know neuroscience has come along and helped us understand yeah. that even better and so many of those neuroscientists are buddhists right i mean some of them like richie davidson um are and and others are kind of in this in this community that that you're part of and um and that is the great possibility that these practices and and i you know not just not just meditation but buddhist psychology buddhist cosmology um really the theology that was that was there for that ram das i think so um was so articulate about that all of this um offers itself up for this this taking this really what is i think an evolutionary next step yeah and on in doing the inner journey in the inner work and the outer work so that we uh so that our presence in the world mat you know aligns with with the kind of people we want to be and that we let those two things be in relationship with each other and we allow ourselves to be and everyone else we meet to be which is a tall order and uh we have no choice but to work on that mm -hmm. i read uh you said something that uh, was very it's very positive krista and i loved it hope like every virtue is a choice that becomes a practice that becomes spiritual muscle memory it's a renewal resource for moving through life as it is, not as we wish it to be. Very good, as they say in India. Very good. <laughs> and, and I mean, isn't that the practice, right? Yeah. Living, living, uh, befriending life as it is and not as we wish it to be, befriending ourselves as we are and not as we wish to be. <laughs> yeah. But hope, you know, hope is a very... It's a positive word, okay? You hear yeah. hope and you go, oh, wow. Yeah, you start to feel a little bit more up. Yeah. And, and I like that in, in that it's a, a, you know, it's, it's a choice yeah. that we can make. Yeah. To me, and to just by. be, yeah. Positivity is, you know, I have a hard time with this in, in my own life. I don't know why. Maybe it's because I'm from Canada. It's so, Montreal, it's just... Yeah dark and snowy for like five months okay and <laughs> freezing so but um i i think that kind of regeneration of a positivity that allows us to be a little bit more courageous and uh to move through life with contentment and that's what i think uh because well, yeah, the, the, there was some other beautiful stuff around i could be here krista with you for you know hours about all the different <laughs> things that i loved on on being and that were are great uh themes to to discuss for sure um but uh we're kind of near the close here and i i just um i i i, I just you know have to uh talk about one last Thing, okay and that is happiness mm. and you did uh, and and I just mentioned it uh, you did a um, a show with if you want to call it that with Matthew Ricard right yes yes and it was happiness is a practice not a pleasure yeah and I think people really have um, misconceptions about that mm -hmm. word and i myself and, and so i just mentioned this uh, in another podcast so i'm repeating again but it's so important i my father and i'll t you know it's fun to tell you who've not heard yeah. this before uh, my father came to india to see how my brother and i were supposedly he said i want to come and check you out we right. thought okay you're going to come all the way over here like at that time it's not that easy you know and so he did come over and then we're sitting around with Neem Karoli Baba and Maharaji said to my father, so why did you come here? He said, well, I came to see how my sons were doing. And Maharaji said, well, how are they doing? And he said, 
well, they seem happy, which we were. And Maharaji said, happiness is everything. <laughs> and, okay. And I yeah. took it, but over the years, I've taken it to mean, you know, most of us associate happy. It's a kind of happy that gets us out of being sad. It's a yeah. movement to something to take the place of boredom, perhaps. Yeah. It's that kind. But I got uh, taken it, uh, and, and Maharaji did talk uh, about it in the, in, in the terms of contentment, which I, I just mm -hmm. mentioned. And mm. I think that that is really where true happiness lies. Um, and uh, he, what did he say? There are, what are the inner conditions that foster a genuine sense of flourishing, of right. fulfillment? Eh? Yeah. yeah, that, that, what, what too, I think what I took forever after from that conversation was this was a really a preference for thinking about flourishing as opposed to happiness. And as you say, it's like happiness the way we use the word. But that human flourishing doesn't mean, I mean, human flourishing, if you are alive, you're experiencing sadness and loss and grief and failure. Um, so, so flourishing, happiness in that sense is a way of being, like, how do you move through those things? And, and that for me, th that I can, I can work with, right? I can live with that. Yeah. Well, when we talk about flourishing, contentment, they do, you have to include in that acceptance. Acceptance is a big deal too. And none of those things yeah. can happen with that, without that. Yeah. It's also, I think, about having a, a bigger perspective than the events of the moment, which is one mm. thing that, that our spiritual practice helps us do. Um, it can help because, us right now, oh my God. What? Right, yeah. Well, because um, one of the themes that has come through so many different kinds of lives from all my other conversations I've had is that you know, we don't grow wiser and more generous and more ourselves and more loving in spite of the bad things that happen to us. We, we grow through how we live with those things. And, and not just that, you know, if we are able to incorporate them into the life that we have on the other side. And, and that, you know, that, that's a kind of, that's a way to talk about why that equation of flourishing makes sense. Because mm. when, you know, if we, if you live a while, you, you just know, you know, over and over again, that what you think is happening to you and what you think it means, you just have no idea, right? No. You just have no idea. Mm. Um, which uh, is strange and wonderful. Um, the more you can just let that be true and kind yeah. of know it at all times, how much it, however much it may contrast with how you mm -hmm. feel about what's happening. And it goes back to trust, whatever that thing is that turns you on in, in the moment that you realized I am not, I don't think I'm my thoughts. So what are we right. talking about? Right. So trust in whatever carried that moment uh, is, is a, it's always there. That's what Sharon mm. talks about. Also, mm. not that, but about you. You just start over. It's okay. You can start over. Isn't that fantastic? And yeah. As she talks about that. Um, so uh, I, I, I found a beautiful Rilke poem that you had up. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And I love poetry, and I know you do too, because there's a, some wonderful um, themes around uh, poetry and podcasts and so on radio shows um, and so i found somewhere and i cannot remember who said this but the most generous act you can do for another human being is to give them complete attention and i go back to that's what ramdas did when i met him that first second that changed my entire life because that complete attention gave me complete trust and from that trust i launched me over to india you know, uh, a year, year and a half later. Uh, but included in attention, of course, is listening. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. And I know, and there's some beautiful stuff on being, on, on being, which you'll get all, everybody in the show notes, you'll get all the links to Krista's, to on being and, and different mm-hmm. podcasts and uh, that she's done radio shows uh, that we love and that we've mentioned here. Uh, so you can get started if you have not heard of on who hasn't heard of on being raise your hand okay <laughs> two people you know speaking of unmixed attention i think if simone ve there's this line from her a def it's a definition of prayer that prayer is absolutely unmixed attention mm. Isn't that beautiful really? that's something to ponder oh that's fantastic all right can i'm gonna read this poem okay because i because i want to Uh, It's called, listen, quiet friend who has come so far. Feel how your breathing makes more space around you. (laughs) That's terrific. Let this darkness be a bell tower and you the bell. As you ring, what batters you becomes your strength. Move back and forth into the change. What is it like? Such intensity of pain? If the drink is bitter, turn yourself to wine. In this uncontainable night, be the mystery at the crossroads of your senses, the meaning discovered there. And if the world has ceased to hear you, say to the silent earth, I flow to the rushing water. Speak, I am. I mean, geez, this is from Sonnets to Orpheus 2, number 29. Um, Thanks for putting that. I had never read that, and uh, that's just a fantastic poem. Yeah, I turn to that poem. I I keep that poem with me. Yeah, that was translated (laughs) by Joanna Macy. Oh, really? Did you know no. that? Yeah. No, 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 yeah. no. Yeah, she is, among other things, a beautiful, she's the only Rilke translator I will read. Really? Okay, yeah. I'm going to duly note that. Yeah. Is Joanna with us still, Krista? She is. Yeah. Oh, I um I I emailed with her not long ago. I did an mm. interview with her that I would actually recommend. Um, it's called A Wild Love for the World, and wow. I think in that show she reads that poem. Really? Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. You guys that are going to put the show notes together for this, A Wild Love for the World. Yeah. Which, which reminds Macy, me of. It's so beautiful. I, oh, God, Joanna Macy, who I love yeah. and Ramda spent time with, and we have a wonderful mm-hmm. video of it, the bet. two of them, actually. Um, and uh, it also reminds me, Krista, have you done something with uh, Mindur Rinpoche? You know who he is? I ha- yeah, I've met, I've met him a few times. I, I haven't had him on the show. Um, to be honest, it's partly an English thing because for the public radio show, it like might I, be. A, yeah, it's, he was, it was pretty good. I you know should, he's. I know he's incredible. I I met him with Richie. I've met him a few times. Yeah, and I've met yeah, him. He was that most or, recently oh, with Richie Davidson. Yeah, and the original. Meditator. I know he's an extraordinary teacher, and I I know so many people who who are influenced by him. Yeah, he wrote. The only reason I thought of it is because his book is called "In Love with the World." Right. Yeah. Fantastic book. But I will say, I I actually did what I'm doing with you, and he was in Kathmandu. Actually, Krishnas and I did it together, and it was just one of those things where it was perfect. And if you, yeah, you go up there one day if you go to Be Here Now Network and just Yongi. Uh, uh, Rinpoche, uh, Mingju Rinpoche. Yeah. And I, I, you know, I put, as you know, I'm going to put this up on YouTube as a, cause I record the video, but just looking and you've been there with him. So it's not, I'm not telling you anything new, but yeah. everybody else, right. the radiance is his, too. his presence is beautiful. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's just uh, wonderful. Mm-hmm. And so are you. And thank you really, Krista. Thank you, I appreciate Raphael. you. I'm honored to be with you and I'll be uh, back next December, I think. Okay, I'd good. Like yes, to. all those things are going to continue. Jack yeah. will be there again in in yeah. uh, in December, and some other surprises. So again, thank you, and everybody. You'll be connected uh, to Krista and on being through the show notes. And this is mind rolling on Be Here Now Network. Go to beherenownetwork.com dot com, and we'll see you next week. <laughs>